Matthew chapter 26. I want to read, first of all, verse 33. The Bible said, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And then in verse number 35, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, all also said all the disciples. I want to preach a few minutes this evening on an unbalanced Christian life. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you again for the blessing of being here. And I pray you'd speak to us through your word. Help me to preach the message that you've laid on my heart. And Lord, may I do it according to your will. Guard my tongue. Let me say what I need to. I pray I wouldn't leave anything out or add anything to it. But may the Holy Spirit speak through me and to me and to all of us tonight. And help us and give us understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm preaching on an unbalanced Christian life. And uh, a lot of so-called fundamental preachers, uh, and I hear this some um, being in meetings, they don't like the word balance. And I think the reason is because there have been some in the contemporary movement and this new church age movement that use that word balance and they go to the extreme with it on different things, but when they get through, there's really no balance involved in it all, but a balanced life is precisely what every Christian needs to live. We need to have balance in our life. If you have tires on your car and they're not in balance, it's going to be a rough ride. It's the same thing in the Christian life. If we don't have balance in our life, it's going to be a rough life that we try to live for the Lord. And so preaching has to be balanced uh, in order for Christians to grow. If we're going to hear from the Word of God, we need to be balanced in the preaching that we hear. And I listen to preaching every day. I, hardly ever a day goes by I don't listen to preaching while I'm doing something or driving or walking or whatever. But our preaching, there, there are things that we're against. But if that's all a preacher preaches about is what he's against, you're not going to get much from that. There are things also that we're for. And so we have to preach on what we're for and we have to preach on what we're against. Both of them are vitally important. God's a God of judgment. He's a God of wrath and we need to preach on that. We ought to preach on that but he's also a God of love, and we need to preach on that. As a matter of fact, we really need to preach on love because that's what Christianity is built on. It's built on love. Christianity is not built on judgment. Christianity is built on love. The judgment comes from those who reject the love of Jesus Christ. He said, for God so loved the world he gave. That's the whole foundation of Christianity, Jesus died on the cross and every person that accepts him is saved. He's saved because of the love of Christ and he's saved from judgment, uh, ju the judgment of condemnation. And so we have to preach on all of that. Now in our text, we look in at this man, Simon Peter, and all of us are familiar with Simon Peter. And I, I don't preach a message tonight critical of Simon Peter. Uh, and I, like I heard one preacher say, till you walk on water, you have no right to criticize Peter. And I've tried to walk on water. I've tried it. I've tried it in a swimming pool and never made one step. I went down on the first step. Uh, and I, I really did. I thought, well, let me see if I can walk on water, but I can't. And so I have no criticism of Simon Peter but the Bible puts this in. The Lord had the Holy Ghost put this in the Scripture so you and I could learn. It's profitable for us to look at Peter's life. And Peter was such a great preacher. He was a great apostle, great man of God. Did wonderful things, but he was flesh. But I guess the reason I like Peter is because I can see some traits of myself, not any of the good ones. But the ones where he messed up, I can find myself easily in the life of Simon Peter. And so we want to notice in Peter just a few minutes of life out of balance because Peter's life was 
out of balance when he made these two statements. Uh, we just really want to give you two things this evening. First of all, let me say he overestimated his faithfulness. He overestimated his faithfulness. He made two bold declarations here in this chapter. Number one, he said, yet will I never be offended. Now that word offended, first of all, means to be tripped up. So Peter is declaring to the Lord, I'll never be tripped up, not me, because I'm far too far along for that to happen to me. I'm not going to be tripped up. That's what that word offended. The second thing it also means, uh, the word offended there means to be enticed to sin. So Peter is saying, now that, that's really a foolish thing to say. But he's saying, I'll never be enticed to sin. Uh, nobody's going to cause me to sin. That's just not going to happen with me. I'm beyond that, Lord. So you don't have to worry about me and following you because I'm not going to be swayed by sin. Sin is not going to pull me away. Well, that was a bold thing to say. The other thing it means is apostasy or to become apostate. Now, Peter didn't become apostate, but he did quit preaching one time. He walked away and said, I'm going to go back fishing. He was through. And the others went with him, of course. But he was a leader in that. He, he said, I go fishing. I, I'm going back. Well, he didn't denounce Christ in such a fashion that he didn't say he believed, but by his life, in essence, some might would say Peter was apostate in doing that and turn his back on the Lord. But he said, I will never be offended. You know, I've learned not to say there are things I won't ever do. Now, I, there are things I don't think I would ever do. I don't, I don't think I'd ever, God forbid, but I don't want to stand up here and say I wouldn't ever do anything, but I have no inclination to ever kiss another man. I've said before I'd rather kiss a Georgia mule in the mouth than to kiss another man. I, that's not in my mind to do. I, I, I pray God kill me before that happens. But I don't want that to happen. But I don't think, I don't think there's any way I'd ever rob a bank, you know. But I'm not dead yet. I'm not dead. Now I don't think I'd rob a bank. But I'm not going to get up here and say I wouldn't. I heard about a man, Preacher Moore told about up Peachtree Road, was coming home from work one day, a good man. And he's sitting there, got caught at a traffic light, and he looked over and saw a bank over there with no thought, and he went in there and robbed that bank on his way home from work. Just like that. Out of the ordinary, out of his character, never had been in any kind of trouble. If you're going to get in trouble, that ain't where I'd start at by robbing a bank, but that's where he started at. You know, I don't know what happened to that man that day to make him do that. But I don't think I'd ever do it, but I'm not going to get up here and declare and say that I'm not. I don't think I'd ever quit preaching. I don't think I would. But sometimes the devil, boy, he'll pound you and give you reasons to do just that. He'll tell you reasons, and they sound like good reasons sometimes. He sends these things our way, but Peter said, I'll never be offended. In other words, I'll never be tripped up. There's nobody going to pull anything over me. That's what he said. The second bold declaration he made here in verse 35, he said, yet will I not deny thee. Now we know that he lied there. But he said, I'll not deny thee. That word deny means to abstain or draw away or disown. He did all of that. But he's telling Jesus here, that's not going to happen with me, the Lord I, I, everybody else might do it, but not me. I'll die with you. I'm not going to abstain from you. I'm not going to withdraw from you. I'm not going to disown you. But he did disown Jesus. He disowned him. He withdrew away from him. He stayed. When Jesus went to the house of the high priest, Jesus, uh, uh, Peter stayed on the outside, and that's where his trouble began. And that's a good message right there, getting in trouble from the outside. I didn't think it, just thought just come into my mind, but when you're on the outside and think about in the church or outside fellowship of the Lord, that leads to trouble, and it led to trouble with Simon Peter.
But no doubt, I believe when Simon Peter said these things, I believe he was sincere. I believe that he meant it with all of his heart. I remember a young preacher boy up at Peter Road one time, and preacher boy would have all us preachers preach every once in a while, and sometimes he'd have a few preach, five or ten minutes apiece, and and I remember when them young preachers got up, and he is, I think he was about 20-something. He said, I can remember those Saturday night prayer meetings at the church. He said, we'd be down here at the altar praying and confessing, getting right with God, asking God to forgive us for our sins. And he said, went right down the street, not a mile away to the Waffle House. And he said, before I ever got to the Waffle House, I'd committed sin. I just asked the Lord to forgive me from it. Hadn't gone a mile. That's the nature of the flesh. It can creep up so fast. But I believe Peter was sincere. I believe Peter never had any intention to deny the Lord. I I don't believe he ever had any intention to get tripped up. He was serious about what he said. But why did he say it? He overestimated his flesh. Oh, we ought to be careful about that. Or to be real careful about overestimating our flesh. Now here's the second mistake Peter made in having an unbalanced Christian life. He underestimated his flesh. He overestimated his faithfulness, let me say, correct that he overestimated his faithfulness and he underestimated his flesh. Number one, he didn't see the weakness of his flesh. Now Jesus says here in this chapter, Matthew 26, 41, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter's doing a lot of boasting. And Jesus sends the message his way. He didn't call his name out on this, but he said the spirit's willing. But the flesh is weak. Don't underestimate your flesh when it comes to doing wrong. Here, Peter, when Jesus said that, Peter's found asleep. Jesus had went up and prayed, and Peter, James, and John were left behind. He took him as far as he could, and he come back, and he tells Peter, He addresses Peter because they were all asleep. He comes back. He said the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, we have good intentions, but sometimes the flesh gets the best of us. And so Peter's flesh showed up, but he didn't see the weakness of his flesh. Every man, every woman ought to know their flesh is weak when it comes to doing right and living for God. Then secondly, He didn't see his faulty heart. I think Peter thought his heart was in good shape. But he forgot what Jeremiah said about the heart. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now that's a bold statement to make. The heart is deceitful above all things. Now think about that. The heart, our fleshly heart, it's deceitful above everything. What you and I have inside of us is deceitful above everything. So we got to be careful about that. And Peter didn't think anything about his heart. Uh, Jeremiah made a bold statement. That word deceitful means fraudulent or crooked. Inside of us is a heart a flesh that's fraudulent and crooked. And it don't matter how good we think we are or how good we think somebody else is, that heart is still fraudulent. In other words, it can cover our eyes to what's true. We can think something that's really not right at all and we can easily be deceived. And I preached about that this past week. We can easily be deceived. The heart's the most deceitful thing on earth. And man's deceived by his own heart. Many are going to stand before the Lord at the judgment when he said, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're going to cry out, Lord, we preached in your name, we prophesied in your name, we did many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus is going to tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, all you that work iniquity. What happened to them? They deceived their own selves. They went out to deceive and being deceived. They deceived their own self. They taught their own self in to thinking they were right. And a lot of people do that. Politicians do that all the time. They tell lies long enough to where it begins to sound like the truth. And people do that. 
they tell lies over and over and over again. You know, some people just lie. I don't understand that. Some people just lie. You could ask somebody, they could be sitting on the couch watching TV, and you call them and say, what you doing? They say, I was just making a sandwich. <laughs> I mean, just tell a lie. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Just tell a lie. I, I, I got a friend, and uh, I ain't going to say what his profession is, but I got a friend, and I can call him and ask a question. I know he's lying. I know he's lying to me. But if you're making a sandwich, just say I'm making a sandwich. If you're watching TV, say I'm watching TV. But some people just, they just lie. And they do it. They become, it's almost become a profession with them. That that's what they do. Just lie about it. Deceive their own selves. He didn't see his faulty heart. Then the third thing, he didn't consider outside pressure. Now, this is a real strong thing. And I feel these children going to school, I used to think these young people going to high school, the pressure's on. But it's, it's all the way down to elementary school now with all the junk that's being put in the public school systems in this nation. I mean ungodly trash that's being put in the minds of young children and getting to accept things. And if, if they don't go along, if they don't agree, everybody makes fun of them, laughs at them, ostracizes them, don't have anything to do. And I want to tell you something, that pressure has effects on people. Outside pressure, it happened three times with Peter in John 18. In verse 17, then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. This lady, she thought she recognized him there at the door. She said, you're one of his, aren't you? I, I think I recognize you. He said, no, I'm not. What is that? That's pressure from the outside. Then, then in verse 25 of John 18, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, art now thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. Why did he do that? Outside pressure. He was in a group of unbelievers. He was in a group that didn't follow Christ. And the pressure's on. So he denies it again. And then a third time in verses 26 and 27, one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman whose, Peter, whose ear Peter cut off, he was a relative of Malchus, the one that, that Peter cut his ear off, saith, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the Gamecock crew, or the cock crew, I think it Gamecock in the Greek language. But uh, he said, I think I saw you. The cock was crowing while the dog was returning to his own vomit. So I give, I give you equal time over there. But uh, he said, I saw you in the garden. You, weren't you over there in the garden? So he was in that group that went over there to rest Jesus. And Peter said no. He says in another verse he began to curse. He began to curse. Why? He was trying to prove that he wasn't a Christian. Think about that. The preacher is trying to prove he's not a Christian. Why? Because of pressure. You know, it's a sad thing. I look around today and see the preachers that they get, people put a lot of pressure on them. They begin to compromise. Uh, they won't take a stand. They won't preach truth. They, they just go with the flow. They, they won't do what the Holy Spirit tells them to do because they have pressure put on them. Now, that's a real thing. I don't say it critically because it could happen to me. It could happen to you. And it will happen to us. There will be people that put pressure on us. You know, some preachers, they don't want to be in that crowd where everybody's preaching out of every newfangled version there is out there. And then come around and say, oh, you mean you still preach out of the old King James Bible? 
I remember Dr. Jerry Falwell, he said I had a Bible and I was in a meeting where Dr. Falwell was and I wanted to talk to him and he said, well, let's go back here because we're going to attract the crowd if we stand here. Well, we wouldn't have attracted the crowd. He would have. They, would have. they wouldn't come around because I was there. They would have come around because Dr. Falwell was there and I, he signed my Bible. He opened it up and signed it and he said very courteously, the old Schofield Bible, said it in a nice way. Not in, a, not in a way to, to cast light on it, but in a nice way. But you know, a lot of preachers, they feel pressure to change. They feel pressure to compromise. And uh, I pray God to help me because that, I don't ever plan to do that, but I wouldn't say I would, but I'm not planning on it. But Peter never considered, when he was telling Jesus this, these two statements, he never considered being under pressure. Somebody said if the Russians took over, the communists took over our nation, you know, they'd just fall in because it's better red than dead. And you say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I'd stand for what I believe in, stand for what's right. You might think differently if there's a rifle pointed at you. We don't know what we'd do. We don't really know what we would do unless we're in the situation. We don't know what we would do. We know what we think. Peter said what he thought. He said, I'll never be tripped up. I'll never deny. And he did all of that. Why? Because his life wasn't about. When he said that, he wasn't considering the outside pressure, number four. He didn't know he was a target. He didn't think anything about the devil being after him. That didn't enter into his mind at all. He, he was there with the Lord. He was excited to be with the Lord just like he was on the Mount of Transfigurations. He wanted to build some tents there for the Lord and Moses and Elijah and just wanted to hang out there. And here he is with the Lord. And, and let me say this, when we're close to the Lord, we always feel stronger. I mean, when we walk with him, we always feel stronger. But there are going to be some times we're not as close. And Peter, in, in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He's telling Peter. He said, Peter, here's something you need to understand. The devil's after you. And can I say to all of us in here tonight, the devil's after us. He's after us. And he does, some boy told Dr. Seitler years ago, Dr. Seitler was up in his 70s, he said, I guess at your age, the devil doesn't bother you anymore. Dr. Seidler looked down at that young man and he said, the devil bothers me more now than he's ever bothered. And he still bothers us. Don't matter how old you get, he still bothers us. He told Peter, he said, the Satan's desire to have you that he can sift you as wheat. We're daily targets of the devil. He wants to destroy us. Peter said it like this, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil wants to destroy us. He wanted to destroy Simon Peter and Peter never give that any thought. When we go out in the world every day, we need to think about this. Our enemy's out there. And we're his target. He wants to do everything he can to destroy us. He wants to destroy everything about us that makes us happy in the Lord. But Peter didn't give any thought about that. When he was making his boast, he didn't think about him being a target of the devil. And then the last thing, his tongue was more dangerous than he knew. And I said a little bit about the tongue the other night. But here's Peter's problem. His tongue is what got him in trouble. He may boast. He, the Bible said it's better not to make a vow than to make it and break it. It's just better not to make the vow. It's worse if you make one and break it. But James 3, 5 said, Even so the tongue's a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Can I say a little can be a lot? 
just depends what it is. But a little can be a lot. A little. And that's what he says here in this verse. The tongue's a little member. It's a little member. But it boasteth great things. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your glorying is not good, Paul said. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? You don't have to put but a little leaven in the bread. And it leavens the whole loaf. That leaven does. And Paul said, be careful about your boasting. Your glory is not good, he said. Don't do it. Because it's leaven to the soul. It's poison to the soul. And Peter, uh, Peter bo- uh, boasted great things without thinking. The tongue is so little. But it causes big problems. I don't know if any of you men have ever said anything to your wife. And after you said it, you wish you had reworded it. Or more wisely, not even said it at all. Now, I've done that. I know y'all wouldn't think of me in that way. But I've done that. Now, if y'all haven't done it, I've done it enough for you. I've done your part. And uh, sometimes we say that we don't mean it the way we say it. Boy, when it comes to SI, once it's out there, it's out there. You got to deal with it then. And you'd say one sentence, and that one sentence can lead to an hour conversation. And it can go on every minute of that hour, and it don't get any better up to the 60th minute. And we, we're... We're having a lot of stress right now. You understand that. We're, we're dealing with a lot of stress right now, my wife especially. And it's, it's hard. And, and I have things just as a pastor doing and going. We just we have a lot just like you do on your plate. And uh, I just need to learn to, to obey that study to be quiet. I just, all I need to do is just learn to say yes <laughs> and nod my head. That would be good. But you know what? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't. And sometimes I say things I wish I had not said. And that's flesh. But you know what causes you to do that? Having an unbalanced Christian life, not being balanced. Not, not having everything in perspective. But you can take a match. A person can drive through the forest and throw a match out the window and set a forest on fire. And that happens. Forest fires have been started in dry weather by a cigarette thrown out of a window. It just takes a little match to burn thousands of acres of land. You know what? The tongue's more destructive than that. And Peter was boasting about how good he was. And boy, did he fall flat on his face. And he boasted so much. When he fell, God put it in the Bible so we could learn not to do the same thing. But it's like a lot of other things we don't learn. But Peter never considered his tongue when he spoke. He didn't think about that. In James 3, 8, James said, But the tongue can no man tame. It talks about the beasts of the field being able to tame the animals. But he said, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That's in your mouth. That's in my mouth. An unruly evil, he said, full of deadly poison. That word unruly means unrestrainable. Unrestrainable. There's something unrestrainable inside your mouth and in my mouth. And if Peter would have thought about it and realized it, he would have held back. But that tongue wasn't tame. It takes God to tame a man's tongue. You can't do it yourself because we have feelings. And before we even think about it, the tongue goes into gear and expresses those feelings. Do you know what Simon did 
he spoke himself into trouble. He spoke himself into trouble. He was unbalanced in his Christian life. His life was out of balance. Why? Because he is counting on self instead of counting on the Savior. That's why we need to lean on Jesus every day and walk as close to him as we can. That's the only way our life can stay in perspective. Otherwise, we're going to be unbalanced and it's going to get us in trouble. I pray God help us to stay balanced tonight. I appreciate your attention. We're going to take time for...